That's right. Hello? Oh, that's wonderful. So, uh, hey, welcome to the panel about developer relations. We've got a, a great panel here that I'll let uh, introduce themselves pretty soon so I don't butcher their names or anything. Uh, but we also have the reporter who's late, but, you know, he's probably interviewing someone. Uh, so before, before we get off, uh, basically the format I want to follow is, uh, you know, uh, going over what it's like to relate to, as it were, and market to developers, how they fit into your overall plan for whatever it is you want to do. Usually it's make money or make sure you can go home on time or not be bored with your life, uh, however does you spend your time. And just to set the context a little bit and then coincidentally buy some time for Alex to get here, I'll just heckle him until he's here on time and then afterwards as well. I thought I would uh, go over some uh, sort of facts and analysis. I know if you're in the U.S., sort of like we're going through a current you know, cycle where facts and analysis are not really valued, so this will be a nice refresher for you. So these are a couple of uh, sort of developer demographic slides that I took with, uh, I assume, permission uh, from one of my buddies at uh, IDC, Al Hilwa, who's, who's one of the, the, the better analysts for developers out there. There's, there's a few other great uh, developer industry analysts, if, if you're interested in knowing about them. But Al, true to his IDC origin and, and his nature, is pretty good about going over numbers. And so if you look at this analysis uh, he has, I was really excited to see this because I've, I've always been hunting for like total population of developers. And those Evans people are always emailing stuff out, but I don't know, they seem a little weird. I never seem to want to talk to them. So when Al came out with this and published it, it was exciting. And, and if you look at this concentric circle analysis, I'm sure there's some fancy name for that kind of, uh, you know, OVO analysis uh, theorem. But you can see that he comes up with this idea that worldwide, I believe this is, there's about 18 and, uh, and a half million developers, right? And he has, you know, the total world population down there and then down to people who basically work in IT. That's what ICT ops and management and, or skilled workers is. And then there's hobbyists and, and uh, sort of citizen software developers and the professionals and so forth and so on. And then you end up with basically a population of, uh, let, let's uh, call it 18 and a half million. Uh, which, which I think is, uh, that's interesting, right? And if, if you're the kind of person who knows how to use pivot tables and stuff like that, that means you can start doing all sorts of wacky models about like, you know, if we sold to 5% of the uh, developer population out there, some tool that's $50 a year in recurring revenue, then I can get funded and have a wall of candy every day. Uh, so that's kind of like a baseline to start thinking about, like the population we're, we're discussing. Now, the only, before, uh, I, I used to be an analyst, so I, I have to have some charts or I break down in a nervous uh, fit. But the only other one I wanted to go over, and this is for U.S., uh, if you'll see, is just a sense of where developers are, right? What industries they work in, what kind of jobs they have. And to summarize it, as it says up here, about uh, just under half of them work in the tech sector, right? So developers writing software to be sold as the core product. And then if I remember, if you look at this, it's basically banking it consumes the uh, banking and finance, consumes the next huge pool. And then government and, and things like that, as you would suspect, and you can kind of all, walk all the way up there. And then you can also see, I like the bottom chart. It's kind of interesting. It shows you of the employees in those industry, what percentage are developers, right? So if you look at those, if developers often feel isolated and alone, it's little wonder. You know, it's not just the Iron Man t-shirts and flip-flops they're wearing around that make them stand apart. It's that they actually are, by numbers, uh, quite a small percentage. So uh, with that, if I was going to leave a slide up, do you like this slide? or the OVO slide. That one's pretty, we'll look at that one. It's like uh, in some art. Uh, so with that, we should kick the panel off here and, and we'll go through some, some questions that we've, we've uh, prepared ahead of time. And by that, I mean we talked for about five minutes. And, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions that we have. And when we get to that, there's a microphone over there. They're recording this so you, know, you can be part of history if you speak into the mic. Otherwise, I'll have to summarize your answer. So to introduce myself very briefly, I'm uh, Michael Cote. I go by my last name frequently. And like I was alluding to, I've been an analyst a few times at a little firm uh, called Red Monk that specialized on developers and at 451 Research. And I worked at Dell on cloud strategy and M&A. And now I work at Pivotal on uh, basically doing um, evangelism for people who do a lot of dry cleaning. Like I talk with, with managers and enterprise architects and CIOs and stuff about what we do at Pivotal. So speaking to a technical audience, developers has always been interesting and important to me, especially since I was one at some point. And that's really uh, how I came about being interested in this topic. Why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Does this work? Yes. Um, I'm Melissa Smolinski. I head up marketing at CoreOS. Um, been doing 
marketing for um, a long time in the infrastructure space, started with like disaster recovery at HP 14 years ago. Um, and then um, also helped launch OpenStack, was at the first um, first OpenStack meetup kind of conference 70, when it was 75 people. So it's cool to see how, fa how big it's grown. Um, then went to a small startup called Chartio. It's a business intelligence um, company. And then now at CoreOS, if you're not familiar with CoreOS, um, we're trying to package up the way Google does infrastructure, um, something we like to call Giphy, and give it to people to start using. Um, and the long-term goal for us is to secure the internet. And it, oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Hi. Um, first off, uh, thanks for helping me pronounce that. I've been calling it Coreos for two years. <laughs> so I guess you it's... like to give out Oreos. Do you? OK. Um, <laughs> So I'm Brandon Hayes. Uh, I run a consultancy here in Austin called The Front Side. We do primarily front end, but I uh, come from a back end background. Uh, I used to build uh, OpenStack stuff for AT&T. Um, so it's nice to be back and see that it's come a ways. Uh, and uh, yeah, so our, our whole, I, yesterday I spent my, my day fighting software. That's still a big chunk of what I do. So I'm here to represent the developer contingent and fight fight for the, the devs, I guess. Hey, uh, um, David Flanders. Um, everybody calls me Flanders, obviously, because of some television show. Um, <clears throat> I am a developer. <laughs> uh, so my job is at the OpenStack Foundation. Um, so I help, uh, newly hired, uh, only been in the job for about four months now, to specifically help build up the application developer community. Um, I always find it funny when I, I, I get invited to these these talks, but it is something I'm desperately passionate about, which is I've been involved with Apache and W3C and IETF and RepRap projects and all kinds of that hobbyist developer circle right there. Um, and the thing that really, really matters to me and the thing that really has made the difference, and especially OpenStack, is actually the fact that we do care about marketing and that you, you need to represent all of these. At the end of the day, all the code in the world is held together by glue and string, as all software developers know. What matters is how that looks to the rest of the world, um, and that's always a really difficult conversation. So I'm actually very happy to, to, to be on the panel, but... I, I, I'm always worried about whether or not I could officially call myself a card-carrying marketing person. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a good characteristic of developers. Lots of uh, imposter syndrome stuff, right? Always lots of self-doubt really fuels us, or former us even. Well, so, uh, you know, just to, just to point it out, like I, I, and, and then there's also Alex Williams, who's the, uh, the founder and, and publisher and one of the people behind the new stack who maybe will show up. But I wanted to basically stack this panel to be representative of most of the forces that are in the developer relations and marketing world, right? So, you know, we, we've got some marketing. We have, we have a developer, but also because Brandon helps run the company uh, that he's part of, he markets to developers for certain things. And then we have David and to some extent, my, or Flanders, I should say, Flanders and to some extent myself who are like in the evangelist role of whatever it is we do. It's, it's marketing, but a different type of marketing sometimes. Um, and hopefully when we get to questions, you can take advantage of the, the different folks that we have out there. So the first question I, I wanna ask, and we'll just go in order from me, I guess, is um, so I'll speak of things in commercial terms, but think about them in whatever goals you might have, right? Like why I care about developers caring about me or reaching them. And, and so, so, you know, with, with, with y'all and, and with Brandon and to some extent with, with you guys at the foundation, you know, there's basically like a sales process, like a process where you're trying to influence someone and get them involved and win them over to you and close a deal or have something that you, you, you reach. And I wonder in each instance, when you think about developers, like first, what's the process that you have at, at, at your organization and how do they fit into that process? Like, is it a very segmented, like we have a five stage funnel process and we can predict this and whatever, or is it a lot more loosey goosey than that? How, how do you think about the, the life cycle? Right, um, so at CoreOS, we started out as an open source company. So we started out with CoreOS Linux, which is our um, operating system that provides automatic updates um, with uh, software patches and security vulnerabilities. So we just started out with all of you know open source components. And I think, I. I the goal of the whole company is to secure the internet, which I talked about, and we believe we're going to do that um, through these different ways, these different components we've built. So honestly, I think our big goal is that, and like the community and developers is a really big part of the open source community that um, is helping us do that. And um, 
from the sales side, yes, we have to make money long term. We have products like Tectonic. We have CoreOS Premium Managed Linux, which is support on CoreOS Linux. We have um, Quay, which is our container registry. Um, so we have those products. Um, and there's different ways. I think there's a top-down approach where you have to have materials for the business side, like marketing to the business side. And then you have to have materials for the developer side that's really passionate about your products and excited about them. And so, um, you know, I think there's that top-down approach. I think there are some studies. I think IDC actually came out with a study that was talking about how you have to have both approaches where it's top-down from that business side and bottom-up. And um, yeah, so I think we're, ch we're right now, we're a startup, we're three years old. So right now we're at that point of trying to figure out the business side a little right. bit more. And, and ju just to drill down on that a little bit before mm -hmm. we get to, to Brandon. Um, so what, how would you distinguish like a tops down approach from bottoms up? Is t does tops down mean like you go over, not over the heads of, but you go over the heads of the developers and you're basically going to the VPs and whoever and, and convincing them and then they kind of like, Push yeah. the developers that way, or what? How well, does that play out? It's actually interesting because I think because we our roots are so much in open source, we have a lot of developers that are really excited about CoreOS products. But then when they go to try to sell it up up the up their chain of command, they're like, "Hey, I need a white paper to tell them why we, right. why I want to use this. I need, um, you know, I need analyst research to like prove that this is like." you know, third party validated and that it's it's good for our company. And so I think honestly it's almost to help the developers sell it internally <laughs> up right. the chain of command where they can get they can get the money to be able to implement these technologies that they know are going to help them in the long run. So, so uh, you know, just to, to, to sum that up, it's sort of like if, if, if you're in a situation where the developers are influencers themselves, mm -hmm. it seems like one of the core things you can do is provide them the material that they need. And, and I think, I th yeah. I'm sure in, in, in our circles of marketing, that's usually derisively said as white papers, <laughs> right? Yeah. Which, which is starting <laughs> to become more metaphoric than literally a white paper, but it's sort of like a standalone, semi-formal thing mm -hmm. that that you could take to the big meeting, yes. or 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 as what did they used to say, pre-populate ahead of time, like pre-wire people, and sort of like inform them what's going on, and let an internal person, a developer, sort of market for you yes. up the chain. Yes. So so how about yourself, Brandon? When you, I mean, I, I I was thinking about one of the one of the things that at least you do market to developers for is hiring, right? And to some extent, with the open source things that you have, kind of marketing with them to kind of rally them to your cause, but. When you think about like both the business goals and other goals that you have, like what, how do developers get involved? Okay, good question. Um, so yeah, uh, a little more, slightly more background on me. Before I I became a developer six years ago, I worked in marketing for six years, and um, so I I get the power of it. I get like there's value in it, and I understand there's a ton of resistance in the developer community to the word marketing um, because it 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 feels insubstantial. Uh, uh, compared to actually building stuff. And so uh, there's really two, two, two facets to marketing in general, and that is doing something really cool and letting people know you did something really cool. And if you drop half the ball on either of those, that so developers get mad because people are trying to like, they think marketing is pushing something that they didn't build something cool, they're just trying to push it. Uh, but if you do the opposite, I see, I see developers bang their heads on this a lot. And it's actually something I'm really passionate about teaching developers. It's a huge facet of what I do in my career is teaching developers how to market themselves. Um, recruiting and selling what we do, you know, we have to sell million dollar contracts as well as uh, recruit developers. And recruiting is actually vastly more key to the health of our business because um, there's plenty of work out there. There's not plenty of developers. So um, going through the process of that, we realize it's very much the same thing. Um, I like to think that open source changed everything around this. I kind of came in post open source. I started developing in 2010. Um, everything for us is really community oriented. Um, but I mean, I, I, I wondered if that affected the, the larger dev ecosystem. And it, I think it's pretty clear it has open sources. Uh, you know, it's infiltrated big giant conferences like this one. So um, our, our, if to get into the specifics of our strategy, it's basically we're primarily bottom up. We don't have a really strong top-down approach. Um, uh, that's something maybe we should work on. But we basically, uh, a bit, when you're marketing to developers, the key word to me is authenticity. So 
Uh, if you are authentic and you offer something of authentic value and you're really putting yourselves in their position and you go, okay, what is this person on the other side of the screen looking for? What are they trying to, uh, what's gonna improve their career? So, uh, and then how do you tell people about that? So for us, it's community events. We organize meetups. We uh, sponsor meetups. We speak at conferences. Um, I mean, those are pretty standard things, but they, ge they genuinely create results because uh, it's not enough to speak at a conference. You have to speak about at a conference about something that actually improves the lives of the people that you're talking to. So if you, if you, can, if you can do that, uh, you will have an army of people fighting and advocating for you, and then your job is to make them powerful enough within their organizations that they can go swing that, uh, the hammer around and say, yeah, I want, uh, for us, it's I want to go hire the front side. They seem to know what they're doing. Uh, for, uh, or I want to adopt this technology. Uh, I want to at least pilot a project with this technology, or I want to hire this consulting firm, or whatever. Uh, but it's making advocates out of, the, out of the individual developers by offering them something of such tremendous value. Yeah, that, that's one thing I, with, with your, uh, uh I don't know, would you say co-founder, co-runner co of the company, Charles, I've talked about with him over the past few years is he's very like um, uh, genuine, <laughs> if, if you will. So he has these epiphanies and goes over them and they're kind of funny. And, it, and one that, that he's articulated that's interesting is if you go to conferences and have a really good talk about technologies you know about, it builds your reputation and then that's marketing. And, and like when you put it that simply, it sounds like something a dumb person would say, but it really is like, it really is a pretty like key thing is, is and I imagine, you tell me if you guys do this or don't do it, but you probably plan out which conferences you go to and the topics you do, and you even kind of have a sense of like, this one will actually be good for driving in business, not just making me look awesome. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a little bit of strategic component to it. Um, and uh, well, not a little bit, it's a lot saying, um, it, it, cause how are you positioning yourself? So we could go speak at a PHP conference and I love the PHP community, but there's not a lot that we have to offer them in terms of services. So you have to pick, you know, adjacent markets and go, uh, you understand that basically, and also understand this is a long process. This is not a short term. Like I think people think that if I go speak at a conference, it will result in business of some kind. People will sign a contract as a result of going to speaking at a conference and you're not. It's uh, like any branding strategy. It's about multiple touches. So you're, you're planting a seed here and you're planting a seed here and you're planting a seed here. And at some point, one of them will spring up. And my experience is that for a smaller business like ours, that's about three to six months. Um, so you lead that by three to six months saying, I'm going to pick uh, conferences or uh, strategies that are in adjacent places that we want to move into uh, about three to six months before we are going to ask people to actually exchange money for services or something. Okay. Well, how about how about yourself? How how do, how do developers fit into the the marketing that you do? Okay. So um, just quickly, how many developers are in the room? Okay. Excellent. So yeah, I really want to talk to you very specifically about this and why it's important. So why you should really love your marketing person, why they're really important. And the reason is, is that they are your first line of defense. Um, in the thing you're building, I love what I do. I love what I get to do. I live it. I breathe it. It is, it is I wake up at 3 a.m. for calls. I'll stay up till midnight. Um, I'm glad to fit in the coding wherever I can. So you're really, really time poor. And that's, that's, that's the biggest problem. So you need help everywhere you can get. And what's really cool about marketing people is that oftentimes developers make the very big mistake to think that they're not uh, quote unquote smart. And the trouble is, is they don't understand different intelligence types. So developers are very high on the IQ scale often, right? But there are other intelligence types and the marketing agents are really high on the EQ scale, emotional intelligence. And being able to engage those people and have them help you defend your castle and the thing you love is the most important reason why you should genuinely find time to work with those marketing people. And that's one of the coolest things about the, the foundation working for me is um, realizing that our marketing team and what we have are incredibly smart people. They're always thinking about how do, we, how do we take the things we're building inside of this community and actually position it in such a way that they understand and they really listen to it. Um, I'll sit down and they'll even, we'll code together. They will share with me their marketing ideas on how you know, we do a little bit of coding and then how that relates to the wider world. And it, it really does become essential for me because having those quote unquote white papers, right? You know, so we, we've just gone through this HPC on top of OpenStack. How the hell do you explain high performance computing on OpenStack, right? And I'm very passionate about it and it's really, really essential, but it's really hard to explain it. So being able to sit down and work with three or four marketing people who actually 
figure out how we can collect the right people in the community, how we can have a conversation, and then how we can put that in the white paper so that you can take that white paper, and when your boss comes to you and says, yeah, we're thinking about cutting your department or this part of your work, you can say, uh-uh-uh, take this to your board, then come talk to me. And so I, I really can't stress enough that, you know, very much go on to OpenStack. They're, they're really, really good. So any of these things, slash HPC, slash SDN, um, all of these different things that we're doing on OpenStack, have that white paper in your back pocket because it is a trump card. It is something you can throw down and you can protect what you're doing. So that's from the top down. I, 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 won't, I do want to go into more in the bottom-up conversation, but I'm sure that you probably yeah, have some no, I, I, I think on, on I think that's a good segue because I think before, before we open it up to questions a little bit, um, we, we should talk about some some tactics, which, you know, can kind of seem like you're like, I, I saw that clip recently from Jaws where he's like chumming the water. And so that's where that comes from, right? Like come down here and chum this stuff. Um, but a lot of tactics can seem kind of like, I don't know, dirty and annoying and below you or whatever. But I think it's, if you're in the developer marketing and relations things, you got to figure out what to do, right? And and just, so so the question before I ramble on more about it is basically like what, one, how do you figure out which tactics apply? And then two, which ones in your, in your situation are working well? So for example, um, you know, when I've talked with people over the years, one of the questions is always like, where do developers go to read things, right? And I find nowadays that's almost impossible to answer. It's sort of like, I guess they're in Twitter and Git and maybe individual communities here, but it's not like, for example, in the early 2000s where it's like, well, you should go to developer works. If they do Java stuff, people publish there, or Java Lobby, like they were very particular things. And then we also mentioned another, t I'm just giving examples of what I mean by tactics. We mentioned other tactics like, here's a white paper. Like, this is a PDF, as, as, as you went over and, and, and you went over as well, that explains this type of, dare I say it, solution that a business might want to use with your technology, whether it's HPC or securing patching server or, or whatever. Um, and it's put in a way that, that this is a tool that you can use or, or a tactic could be out at a conference talking with someone. But I wonder, again, like how do you figure out what the developers you want to reach? How do you diagnose which tactics will work and then which ones are working well in, in y'all's current case? Um, I think <laughs> that's a big question. Um, for me, everything about marketing is a conversation. So um, I think about where people are having conversations about right now, container technology is still still a pretty new phenomenon in the Docker cloud native container container space phenomenon. So I think right now there's a lot of education to do. And so when I think about that, I think a lot about um, to, we do a lot of tutorials, we do a lot of online Google Hangouts, we do meetups where we teach um, you know new technologies, we do t um, workshops, and so I think those type of things are actually where we get a lot of value right now in so terms sort of educational. Yeah, things. a right. lot of educational materials because I think there's just so much um, excitement around these technologies, and I think there's still a lot of education to do on how you can use them. Um, that that's where we see a lot of. Um, I, I, a lot of people are attending, a lot of people are reading those materials, right. a lot of people are going on these hangouts and listening. Um, so I think I think right now education is the big thing for and, us. And, and then you, you raise another question. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in your take on this, because at and that is how how much should you track buzzword allegiance, <laughs> right? Like when in y'all's case, this is not really an issue. Uh, but it's sort of like now it's containers and Docker and like yeah. that's that's the answer to all of our ills. <laughs> and 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 in contrast, like at my company at Pivotal, we when when you run stuff in Pivotal, it's all run in containers and it's our own container technology. Mm -hmm. But long ago, product management was kind of like, but no one should care about that. And so we don't we kind of talk about it more, but we don't really discuss it much. And one of the things I always wonder is like. Yeah, but people really want to talk about containers, so should we just kind of gratuitously go out and talk about containers a lot? Like, and so I, I wonder in, in your thinking, if you identify these things that are like, these are the top 20 keyword searches, <laughs> and therefore we should publish on it. Yeah, you know what? We don't actually do that, but I, I mean, I actually think that's probably pretty smart if you're, if you're looking to get uh, more clicks to your website or whatever, because a lot of people are searching those things. But I mean, I do think like for us, obviously we're in this emerging container space. So for us, it is very valuable for us to be talking right, about right. that because those are our products. Um, but I mean, I think it just depends what your bottom line is, because if you're, I mean, I imagine maybe you guys want to talk about that because it kind of plays sure, in. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I think 
I, we don't play the buzzword bingo, but um, I mean, there's things like right now that are hot topics like Kubernetes and tecton our tectonic enterprise product plays um, uses Kubernetes. So we do, we are, we com we're um, contributors to Kubernetes. And um, so we do participate in a lot of Kubernetes events and, you know, there's different things like that, that yes, we definitely will um, participate in and do tutorials on and do meetups on and go to right. events, put on events. We have CoreOS Fest in a week if anyone wants to go. <laughs> I'm a marketing person at heart. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I guess I guess in, in y'all's case, before we go to Brandon, you're, you're, you're lucky enough to be in the top three mm. keyword searches, at the, I mean, metaphorically speaking, right? So yeah. you experience the benefit of, of being uh, one of the more uh, buzzy things, mm -hmm. if you will. Which, which must be nice. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? I actually think um, it's actually really amazing to do marketing at CoreOS because um, the the whole t the whole engineering team at CoreOS is like building great products, and they're really passionate about what they're doing. So they're out there speaking a lot, and um, so a lot of it's the the team is doing a lot of the marketing, and right. I always say I'm trying not to mess it up and help <laughs> and help them in any way possible. So um, like th I think I I'm lucky. To that I work at CoreOS. It's a great place. Definitely. How, how about how about yourself, Brandon? What uh, what do you find at the front side? Well, for for you, I, I you know what do you find at the front side are good tactics, and also when you have your developer hat on, what tactics do you like and dislike? Um, yeah, it, it's it it can be tough to separate that because I spend about you know, I I split my time half and half trying to market what we're doing, and then and then suffer the consequences of marketing what we do, <laughs> and uh. It, it changes your perspective on this stuff a little bit, having to actually deliver, like making a sale and going, ah, oh, shh, <laughs> like I have to actually deliver that now. Uh, it, it, uh, you and I have talked in the past, we did a podcast together about the hype cycle where I learned, like I, I knew of it, but I didn't know much about it. And then we talked about it and I started, after that, I started digging into it. The hype cycle has become an interesting, uh, an interesting tool that actually, um, it's really elementary to somebody that's a tech analyst. The idea of the hype cycle. I don't know. Is everybody here familiar with the hype cycle? Go over it briefly. Okay. So the hype cycle is a really simple concept that says, with any new technology, there is an initial spark of interest. Uh, that there's some trigger for a piece of technology. Um, if it catches on, it becomes immediately very popular, and everybody's talking about. It. Everybody wants to know what's going on with it, and it hits a peak. Um, called the peak of inflated expectations, where everybody believes this thing is going to change everything. It's going to solve all the problems that you ever had in your life. Uh, it's going to it's going to fix everything. You finally are going to Dockerize your React container, uh, and then the next phase is like uh, it it uh, m people start realizing, whoa, this doesn't solve every problem. There's actually it actually comes with its own baggage, and it's there are tr additional trade-offs with it, and it hits a thing called the trough of disillusionment, where everybody's like, wait a minute, this that's was my favorite. Yeah, the trough is amazing. Uh, <laughs> And then if the technology survives cr not crashing in that trough of disillusionment, it gets to climb to the slope of enlightenment where people start realizing, wait, there are ways to use this and, these, and I can make educated trade-offs with this. And then eventually a technology reaches a place called the plateau of productivity where it's just quietly productive. There aren't any hacker news articles about the plateau of productivity. Nobody says, hmm, yeah, I've been using Ember for about 18 months uh, pretty productively. It's pretty nice. Like, once something gets to that plateau. I'm, I'm glad that's the voice you read all yeah, those comments um, in. It's the, it's <laughs> my Kip Dynamite developer voice, I guess. Um, uh, so so th that cycle happens invariably to every technology. And once you understand that, you can decide where you fit there. I have friends who say, F this, I'm going for the peak. Uh, I'm gonna, and as soon as the thing crashes in the trough of disillusionment, I'm going to bail and go to the next peak. And that's their marketing strategy because they're selling shovels in a gold rush. If you're a shovel manufacturer, you want gold rushes. And so you keep going back to the next gold rush. Uh, and then, but if you're, I, I don't work like that. And so I want our company and the rest of the marketing I do for my life to be buzzword resistant and not buzzword compliant. So buzzword compliance is awesome if you're gonna stay in that peaky area and you're willing to jump technologies to stay in it. Uh, but for us, you like you know you've been through this cycle a few times, and you start realizing, oh, okay, I know where the peaks and valleys. I know where this is going, uh, and I want to uh, I want to target that plateau. Like I want to watch for the pl technologies that are going to adopt that plateau, uh, and I want to build a business that that resists the uh, over enthusiasm of the peak, so that it can survive the crash in the trough of disillusionment. And so uh, again, that so that really comes down to like what you adopt, what technologies. So 
it would be like a year and a half going after React for people in our front end community, um, or Elm right now, things that are really peaky, and understanding, okay, that's something we need to be aware of, uh, but we're targeting things that uh, are gonna ride that out uh, and try not to get seasick on this like hype cycle. So that, that, that drives a lot of our strategy. Um, uh, one, one last thing I'll say, there are three things I think you can do to get somebody to love you. You can feed them, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can teach them, and you can listen to them. And so uh, we try to do all three. So we try to teach people, we try to feed them at meetups or whatever, uh, not as much, we're not a cafe or whatever, but uh, we'll buy a pizza. Um, and uh, we try to listen. So uh, if, you're doing, if you're doing those things, then you have, uh, my opinion is you probably have a pretty strong community uh, then it's just a question of picking which community you want to do those things for. Yeah, there's 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 something to sort of pick out from a lot of what we've been talking about that I think in the, uh, I don't know, the non-nerd sales world, they call being a trusted advisor. This is another great corporate term that you'll come across a lot. And and uh, I haven't really ever thought of applying that to the developer marketing world, but much of what we've been talking about, whether it's giving knowledge out or, or the, the, the three ways to get someone to love you is basically like, and, and then also to some extent the plateau of productivity stability is like that person like has their stuff figured out and they can kind of advise me about what I should be doing and therefore I trust them and therefore like what do you want me to buy? I mean to, <laughs> to turn it into a joke but that does seem like a, a, a valid goal to have with the developer community is to, is to, is to be an advisor to them essentially. Well, how, how, how about yourself? So um, when it comes to tactics or, yeah, or how so you analyze what to do. So, okay, I covered the, the top bit about why top down you want the marketing person to be able to give you that, that, that white paper which protects you and defends what you want to do. Um, the, the way that they get to that white paper is by participating with them in the bottom up. So we even have an acronym, um, and I, I completely agree with Melissa on this. It's, it's about the conversation, right? In fact, we, our acronym is ABE, uh, a, always be educating. Uh, and that's really the core of what we do. So developers, this is what you want in a good marketing person, and Melissa is actually a really great example of this, uh, as, are, are, as are the people who, do, who work in the foundation, like uh, my boss, Lauren Sell, and all the rest of it. They do this really, really cool thing at events. So yes, you're always running events that are trying to educate people, because we all know as developers that if you left this industry uh, and, and left it for three to four years, you'd come back and all the tools would be different. That's how quickly we're moving the whole time. So what you want to do when you find that marketing person who's the right marketing person, the things that they'll do is they will go around and they will help facilitate the conversation. And yes, some of it will be buzzword bingo and bullshit and all the rest of it. But the, the fundamental thing is, is we're not entirely an engineering science. We are a social science as well. The, whatever emerges as the new LAMP stack for the cloud will be done through social science as much as it will be done through engineering. And the reason is, is because you've got to get a bunch of people to agree this thing. You've actually got, you, you have to have the conversation and go through the pain of having the debate because it's through that that finally we'll have signal from noise. And once we've got signal from noise, then we can start to push on the next thing. And so having someone like Melissa who goes around with you and says, hey, I, I heard this conversation. Why don't we go and pull and have this, this this chat and they're literally again it comes back to emotional intelligence right it's it's about the fact that they they're listening all the time they're not trying to find the solution they're doing that social science bit to try to say okay what's happening here what's happening there what's happening in all these different places and then br r doing lassos um, I forget the American word for this um, around the communities to, to bring people together lasso. Thank you, Lasso. Sorry, and it, even in Drop Texas, I've made a I've made a major major cultural faux pas. We'll we'll talk about cultural intelligence later. Um, but yeah, so really, again, just to summarize, as a developer, spend time to find the marketing person, go to events, have have the conversations, meet up every night over beers. That's the other thing; they have good budgets for beer. Um, so go go and chat with them and say, I heard this and I heard that, and they'll be like, Oh, I heard that. So they're another pair of ears. There's somebody who's going to allow you to figure out what that conversation is, which won't, which will also figure out what next event you want to do, what skills training you want to do next to be able to keep up with everything. But it'll then also help inform them when they need to create that white paper, that defensive tactic you need to be able to protect your kingdom and all the rest of it. Yeah, that, that's that's a that's an excellent point that meet, meets up with the relations part of developer relations and marketing. And and to use another metaphoric word, it's 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 sort of like trying to be a concierge between the outside world and your internal hotel staff. This metaphor is going terribly wrong. <laughs> but you know and and I, and I I do I do notice um, 
you know, having been an analyst and things like that, I've worked with lots of a- analyst relations and press relations people who serve a similar role of they're basically trying to hook hook people up, like not in the late night sense of it, but they're saying like, you're interested in this, I have someone who's interested in that, and you two should meet and talk with each other. Well, it's, cool. it's that intellectual thing. You, you need somebody to recognize that they're on the same wavelength. Definitely. Because we do get in a lot of arguments in the developer community, and arguments are good at one stage. Believe it or not, it's the consensus bit, which is hard to find, that signal from noise. And, that, right, and right. most of the time that's coming through um, our marketing staff and all the rest of it who are actually making that EQ link, that emotional intelligence right. link between people. And, 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 I, and I think, I mean, just to use a, a tactic that I try to use along those lines and that I've noticed other people do is, is it's almost, there, there's almost two, well, there's three stages of it. One, you're not doing any sort of hooking up, concierging or whatever. Uh, and then two, you're only doing it to whatever you have allegiance to, like within your company and, you know, f- trying to fit them in that, that closing a deal funnel. But then three, it's more of like you're just trying to hook people up with what you know, right? And a huge part of what you know is, of course, like helps determine how you get paid every month, like is, is your company. But it's often good, especially in trying to get to that trusted advisor status, to even if it's hooking someone up with something that you get no monetary or whatever benefit from, it keeps that discussion ongoing and that relationship built. And I mean, I think that's something I notice. Uh, I would say lower level and more chintzy marketers don't really do well. They're always trying to steer you towards, you know, that legion moment instead of just keeping the conversation going essentially. So to that end, uh, if there's any questions, we have a microphone here. I didn't want to do the thing where like I make you line up and stand while we talk. So uh, feel free to come up and uh, ask questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, one of the things that you mentioned was the authenticity. And while we are marketing to the developer community, do you think the profile of the person is he should be a software developer trying to get into marketing rather than a non-tech marketing person. So I'm a non-tech marketing person. Sometimes I do feel that I, I have a barrier that I, and again, uh, I have a barrier that, yeah, I can read about 100 different things, but somehow that authenticity will not come because I have never coded per se. Just your views. Learn to code. <laughs> like, you don't have to be good at it. All you need to do is sit there. Like, my marketing people will sit down with us. And, like, just yesterday, we, we, I was, they were just like, yeah, explain Git and Garrett to me. And we love, we love to talk about that stuff. And best of all, the cool thing is, is they then work you through how people will understand that. Because one of the troubles as developers is you're always a thousand steps ahead of where everybody else is. And once you're on this escalator, you're always moving up. And being dragged back down to step one, the zone of proximal development, the next step that somebody's willing to take, that's, that's an incredibly powerful thing. So just sit down with your, your devs and be like, hey, just show me this one thing, and you don't have to take a lot of time. And it's just as a nice conversation to have between the people as well. And you don't have to understand it. You don't have to code and all the rest of it. It's just so you kind of understand how my brain is wired, because it, it's wired in a weird way. No, I didn't understand when you say your developers. I mean, I'm the one who's marketing to the developers. so. The question is, where is my developer? Again, here's the here's the challenge that I have. You know, like my wife, she is an she is a developer. She has been a developer for the last twenty years. Okay. The moment she starts speaking with the other developer, I can see the smooth conversation that goes on. And yes, I mean, it's a good thing to say that you learn. Yeah, I will learn certain things in six months. But is that is that good enough to be authentic? And I don't think so. So okay. can I? Yeah, I, I I have a thought on this, and it's. Pretty, pretty much runs counter to, to your thoughts on this. Um, I, I do think that uh, th- because uh, authenticity isn't where that comes in. Uh, authenticity is, I, that's actually empathy. So the three things I look for in a marketer are authenticity, empathy, and courage. Like if you can be authentic, like you are, uh, tr- you're presenting something of a- authentic value. So it's actually more about your confidence in your in your value offering for for what you're doing for someone. Uh, the the empathy comes in from being able to code and be and exchange tokens. You're basically so when you're a developer, you get to exchange tokens, and that can sub in for authenticity. But I know a lot of inauthentic people that can speak developerese and exchange these tokens and say, "Okay, we're good, right?" Um, and uh, they're you know hardcore sociopaths, and I've gone to work for them, and it's been not great. So. Uh, uh, the, the authenticity wasn't there. So I, I, I would say, uh, I, I don't know if you should learn to code or not to be able to have these conversations, but I think authenticity is a separate function from being able to empathize with developers. Um, 
so I'll, I'll just say, can I say one last thing on this? Sure. And I, I don't need any, say anything else for the rest of the thing. Uh, the number one thing I learned as a marketer that permeates my marketing style now, that I, when I forget it, it, it's because I lack courage. And it is going out, talking to people, and listening to them, which is pretty much your job and pretty much your job, but it's hard for somebody who's actually developing software. You're actually in a great position to do this because you don't develop software. Your job isn't to ship things the way that, that it can be. Uh, the best marketing content I've ever got, I used to fancy myself a really good marketing copywriter, and I would be shamed by how good the content was when I went out and listened to people and wrote down the things that they said to me about my own product. So if you are shipping things to people, it provides value to them, and they come back, they will come back with the language that you use to market to other developers. And you don't need anything else, in my opinion. Well, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll let the next person ask a question since we have five minutes. I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but go, okay. go ahead. Okay, yeah. So uh, a little off topic, but Brandon was talking about the hype cycle. So I'd like to know from all of you, where, where are we, OpenStack, on the hype cycle? And I, I'd like you all to spit it out at the same time so that you don't influence each other's opinion. <laughs> how, how about cycle's you? cycle's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> how, 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 about, how, about, how about you You also answer first and say, took, took away your answering from the last round. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think OpenStack is like still like, I mean, I think actually is having um, a resurgence. Actually, I don't I don't know where that is on the hype cycle, but <laughs> and if the hype cycle's bullshit, then maybe there's another part. Well, but I don't mean that it's bullshit. It does map <laughs> a reality. I, I do agree with you on, on that point. But the trouble is, is we're in microservices here, right? You need to map against each one of the projects. You know, it's it's you know, uh, let's talk about SDN on the hype cycle. Let's talk about um, containers on the hype cycle. Things like that. So it's. It's really hard to, you know, you're, you're talking about a community. OpenStack's very hard to talk about as a, as a single product. Um, yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, I would say it's basically like emerging from the trough of disillusionment, right? Like I, I was doing a podcast with someone earlier, and uh, uh, it's like I was on Meet the Press all of a sudden. They were like, you said you hated OpenStack. Or do you recant that now? And it's like, holy crap. <laughs> I, I thought I was just here for the free coffee. <laughs> but but uh, but I, I think I think there 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 was as I, as I was telling them there was this dark time where there was definitely OpenStack was in the trough of disillusionment and there were lots of people who were like drive by pooping all over it and <laughs> there were issues and things like that but nowadays like other than some people who just have gotten burned over the years by it and so have a grudge like everyone seems kind of cool with it in the same way that once you're in the plateau of productivity it's like and i don't want to compare openstack to usb and stuff like that but like no one like gets excited or depressed about usb stuff it's just like you just plug it in and you go on with your life right and that's that's kind of what you want to get to in the plateau of productivity and so when there's not a lot of like excitement or hate around it like that's usually the area where where you're emerging out of the trough that's my take at least you, you got anything you want to add brandon no all right oh, Next question. So hopefully uh, we can make this quick, but I actually work for AT&T. Um, I am building You don't up, say. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm one of the leads helping build our new community team. We are 100% focused on developing upstream. We're trying to get a bigger footprint in the community. Uh, we use OpenStack a lot. We have a huge cloud zone and everything like that we're using it for, and we want to be able to start giving back. So the issue that we're running into is that a lot of developers nowadays have this, like, terrible idea of what big corporations are and they don't really want to work for big corporations because it's like a no-no like oh it's just the big guy he's gonna stomp all over us or whatever um, so I was just wondering do you guys have any advice on what I can do to make a big corporation look uh, I don't know better to the developer world I mean I'm a developer and I'm fine with it but I know there's a lot of developers out there that are like no never <laughs> just because sure. we're a big company yeah, I mean, I think the more cool tech that you could talk about, like be out there speaking at shows, be out there write, like I don't know if you guys have a blog, like an engineering blog or something like that, but yeah. writing things that you think uh, that the other, like the community would actually be really interested in learning about things that hacker newsworthy uh -huh. um, type posts and um, I, I, that's what I would, that's my recommendation. So it's just trying to get out there as much as possible and speaking about the cool technology you guys are using and starting to talk to people in different communities. And maybe, maybe it's not just like being in the OpenStack community, but branching out to other communities as well and, and sharing your knowledge with them as well. So look up something, uh, it's by the Burkana Institute. Um, and they have, they have some uh, life cycle of emergence uh, thing, which is really cool. Um, and so there's four keywords in this, uh, especially with regards to community that I run through my head every single day. 
uh, name, connect, nourish, and illuminate. So job number one, name people. You know, give a shout out to what they're doing. You just do that every single day. Connect people. Walk up, and again, marketing people are really good at this. That typical thing where you've got two developers, you can go up and be like, hey, such and such, meet such and such. They're doing this cool thing. Hey, meet such and such. They're doing this. That connects them. That builds the fundamental relationships. Nourish them. You'll have people in your community who are long time there. Show, go back to them and, and love them and say, we really love what you're doing and how you're supporting and how you're working with us. And finally, the really biggest thing of all, which again goes towards this, this whole bit about having a larger conversation is, um, illumination and illumination happens after you have you know a hundred conversations and you find the signal from noise and then you publish the white paper or the blog post or run the next training so check check out Burkana Institute they've okay. they've got a great thing and community is the right word on all this you're doing exactly the right thing get involved upstream mm -hmm. because um, Everybody I know, the big companies working on OpenStack, they're loved because individuals' names get attached to them, okay. right? All of a sudden, you've got a really cool developer working for HP, and when it's it's funny, like what, literally, we've had like three or four developers moving companies, and all of a sudden, it's like your allegiance for that company kind of moves with that person. So mm -hmm. keep keep doing pushing the community angle, and yeah, build that team. How, how about yourself, Brandon? We'll just go a little bit over. Um, no, I, I fully agree with all of that stuff. Um, from my experience working at AT&T, the question is whether you're trying to change the organization in some way, which you can't do at AT&T, um, or are you trying to uh, change a little bit of perception around the organization so that you can build a really fun team? And it sounds like that's what you're trying to do. I fully agree with that advice. And it's um, it really is about building the kind of, like connecting with the kind of people that inspire you and uh, investing in them. And like that's, Exactly what you said, and what you said, I, I'm down. And, and before I close it out, I mean, what what I would say to add to all of that is, uh, uh, if only to keep yourself sane, uh, <laughs> figure out the people you don't care about, right? Like segment out, like like back at Red Monk, we had this notion of of developers and what they pay for, and there were the people who will pay you money, the people who might pay you money, and the people who will never pay you money, right? And similarly, when it comes to will like me or whatever your goal is, like. As long as you're, as long as you're very aware of the people who like will just never like you, you, you know, you'll be happier when you wake up at three in the morning and need to use the restroom, right? To be able to go back to sleep. But it's really important to always know, like those people, they don't like me, and that's fine. And and especially at a place like yourself. Yeah. But so hey, th those were uh, great questions that we had, and and thanks so much for for the panel. This is really fun to uh, uh, have this discussion. As we close out, so where where could people uh, reach you? I'm if you will go to Twitter, you can find me at Cote C O T E. Yourself. Yes, on Twitter, I'm at Melsmo, M-E-L-S-M-O. Um, and like all developers, I exist exclusively on Twitter. I'm Tev Viking, T-E-H Viking. Yeah, IRC and Twitter, D-F-F-L-A-N-D-E-R-S, or uh, yeah, yeah, you can easily Google Flanders and OpenStack and you'll find me. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, thanks everyone for being here and attending, and thanks to the panel.